Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good day, Mr. Rob. Hello, Stephen. And our guest today is uh, Bernard Golden. And I first met Bernard in the middle of the financial crisis. I believe Lehman Brothers was collapsing in Manhattan. And he was there with his uh, Virtualization for Dummies book. And I still have a signed copy, and someday I'll sell it on eBay for millions. But uh, until then, let me just introduce Bernard. Bernard, how are you doing? I am extremely well, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. Well, you know, we're really excited to have you here. And, uh, you know, I think we're just going to jump right in, Bernard. Um, you put out a post this week, Edge Computing and the Death of, the cl death of Cloud Nonsense. And it has a nice tombstone from 2006 to 2017 on cloud. So can you uh, kind of just give us a high level overview of that blog? And then, uh, you know, we'll jump in from there. Yeah, you know, well, um, I've seen a lot of talk in the industry about how, you know, the edge computing is going to mean the death of cloud and, you know, that edge computing is going to require so much processing and so much stuff at the edge that basically cloud will become just this kind of your repository and that the majority of processing will be out on the edge. And I just think that's nonsense. And, uh, and and the 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 worst part about it, from my perspective, is there's really no sort of analytical framework or no kind of rigor around this. It's just sort of a you know an assertion, and it kind of falls into what I call the anecdote, anecdote, vapid truism, talking points kind of mantra. <laughs> I love the vapid truism. Yeah. So so pe you know you'll have people go, well, autonomous cars, you know, can't wait for the latency back to a central place to react like if a pedestrian steps out yeah undeniably true <laughs> then they'll say something like and there's times like if you're if you've got a machine out on an oil derrick on the middle of the sea it has no connectivity undeniably true the vapid truism is so therefore you know cloud computing and centralized processing you know won't be able to deal with most edge computing so therefore, because I hope to sell servers to all of these things, that means I've got a really bright future. I, yeah. It's not That's even cool. servers. It's they want to sell hyper-converged, super expensive, right, specialized um, yeah. gear, right? And, yeah. and, you know, so it's like, and so I said, so, okay, I no, it's undeniable. Autonomous cars, you don't want one going back to, a, you know, 1,800 miles to a server and all that. Got it. I wouldn't want that from if I was the pedestrian or if I was at the, was in the car. Obviously, an oil derrick or a army base out in the middle of nowhere don't have network connectivity. The question is, what, to my mind was, so what proportion of all edge computing will those kinds of use cases be versus you've got a thermostat that sits in a house and once a minute it goes, or, or a commercial building, and once a minute it goes, is it still 68? And, you know, and needs to send that back saying, hey, it's still 68 to some central thing that does whatever, which doesn't require Wizzo Bango processing so, on the edge. So all, all of your examples are control loop examples. I, I actually, one of the bizarre twists of my, my backstory is that I actually worked on oil derricks doing IT, helicoptering out to the Gulf of Mexico. And what you're describing is control loops, right? And you're right. You don't you never put an external internet connection on a control loop because that's not a control loop. It's it's a report. It's a log. It's something like that. What about other use cases that aren't right? Where it's a car communicating with another car or a stoplight, or it's a, a store camera system that's doing facial recognition and sentiment analysis. And there, I mean, there's a lot of interesting compute high intensive compute pieces that are not quite control loops or are coordination loops that aren't self-contained from that perspective. Do you consider that edge? And is, is that something that, you know, needs a local low latency component? So let me just understand those examples. So there's the facial yeah. recognition. There was the cars interacting with one another. Right. Um, well, uh, I mean, to me, the cars interacting with one another is kind of a another is an extension of the and it needs to have local autonomous stuff. And I absolutely bought that for the cars. It was like, yeah, 
you want processing right there. So, you know, because 200 milliseconds, which is 10th at what, 20, 20th of a second, um, uh, might be too yeah. long for, you know, a car to, st to delay in putting on the brakes. Absolutely. So yeah, the, those kind of, those kind of situations, yeah, you're going to have local processing and part of that will be undoubtedly communicating to nearby automobiles to interact with that. So they, they do, they do have these high tech devices on cars called brake lights that operate yeah. at the speed of light <laughs> between <laughs> cars. Well, but I mean, you know, I can see that if you're going to say, I'm going to have an autonomous vehicle, you're going to want it being controlled locally. That's, right. As I said, that's undeniably true. The question is, what percentage? Um, facial recognition? Um, yeah, I, sub I mean, I, I guess the question is, so that's got a camera. Right. And then the question is, where would the functionality to, to, uh, to do that matching occur? Would it occur on the device or... Well, you know, in you're, the store you're not, you're not going to, what I've seen is it's in store, um, mm -hmm. right? There's a data center in the day, in the stores, right? And from my perspective with machine learning and algorithms and just Javelin's paradox in general, driving cheaper compute, the, it makes sense to do a lot of data analytics and things like that in the store if you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cloud aside, it, it's, it's, there's a logic to saying, I have to do a whole bunch of work. I have to process a whole bunch of data. I'm not going to send all of that data to the cloud. And it's not even a comp computational problem. It's a data egress ingress problem before I wait to process that. Now I'm going to send it back to the store. Just do it in the store. Um, and that makes a ton of sense to me. The same thing is true with certain like rendering jobs and analysis jobs and things like that. But to me, the question is, do we actually understand what environmental computing looks like today? And, and well, I'm not sure we do. Well, um, I mean, I think, I think two things about that. One, yes, you're absolutely right. We don't know what kind of interesting, amazing stuff people are going to come up with to do with computing once you get IoT. I think that's undeniable and absolutely true. That's amazing. And I use my favorite example of, of IoT in my piece, which is the Withing scale that is, you know, not only does it, is it internet connected to, does it have Wi-Fi to connect to an app and blah, 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 and it's stored in the cloud and all that to tell you, you know, this week you weigh X and last week you weighed one, you know, 1.07 X, so you've lost a little bit of weight. It's actually connected to your social media and tweets out and all this stuff. Right. You know, that's really interesting uh, use case. So I think, yeah, we, undeniable. My question slash issue around the scenario you've outlined is great. You've got hyper-converged stuff or a server or whatever you want to say, a data center on the store premise. So here we are at a, I don't even know what, some kind of a store and there's some equipment in a back room and how does that stuff run? How does it get maintained? Who's going to be running it? Because Distributed stuff is great until it's not, and the reason it <laughs> typically turns into it's not is when I it's like technologies. yes stuff breaks or it, it you know isn't being maintained properly or somebody decides to pull the plug out, whatever the heck it is, and that's so that's so, my my so observation you, about that. You you hit to me that is the fallacy of these vendor based um, ideas of one thing has to win or the other. Because what, what, when I hear all that, there is no, you know, edge is not different than cloud. The, the, the reality I see is that everybody does everything first in the cloud. You're, and, and, and only after you've proven that the locality matters and that you need proximity or you can do it more efficiency, efficiently by moving it to an edge infrastructure, then you say, oh, well, I want to move this workload from the cloud to the edge, but I better not change that workload very much to do it because I might move it back and forth. It's like the people who are so gaga on Node, 
Node.js uh, because I'm writing JavaScript on the server. I'm writing it on the app. I'm writing it in my Switch. I'm writing, you know, it's like JavaScript taking over the world. They love it because it's it's portable, right? The JavaScript, oh, it shouldn't be running in my browser. It should be running on the server now. Let's just copy the code to the server. That right. type of portability makes a lot of sense to people, right? It's that's to me the the, the missing piece of the edge beats cloud silliness. I, I think it's silly. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because uh, I, I had an example, another example in the blog piece that was about this uh, Sandvik company. And it was an example of the sort of the new Azure IoT Edge, I think it's called, or Azure Edge IoT, which is basically the ability to place processing out at an edge location. And it, it, basically it's a, it's a partitioned app. Most of it runs inside Azure for this overall machine and collection of machines, but it does have processing on the machine so that if it encounters a catastrophic failure condition, like something breaks and the machine needs to be stopped right now, this thing is like, you know, six inches away from, it, it's like attached to the device okay. and it can catch that signal and stop it immediately. Well, what's interesting about what you just brought up is it's portable because it runs in a Docker container. So it's code inside a Docker container. The other interesting thing about it is it runs on a, on a system on a chip device. It's like a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Well, which is sort of so much for the fantasy of, you know, we're going to sell big server farms out on, out on the edge, which is where a lot of vendors are right now. I mean, this is a thing that's like 10 bucks and you can pick it up, you know, like at a hobby shop. I mean, if Radio Shack still exists, you can get it at a Radio Shack. That's, that's a, you know, that's the kind of distributed computing that for this particular example, the... I yeah, I, 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 but I see you're going to get to a point where you're going to have a hundred of those, and then they're all going to be beaconing back through a, you know, a, a, a T1 line or you know some some limited bandwidth network, and you're going to say, ah, I need to aggregate this stuff together, and then that's where the Azure uh, little Azure pieces or there's green grass from Amazon where they're like, oh, we'll sell you Lambda in, in the sh in the field, we'll sell you, it, and people, it's edge, but it's also cloud, it's weird. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, um, so interestingly, they had another example from uh, Schneider, which I know Schneider Electric from mm -hmm. data center stuff, but this was actually uh, oil pumps out in the field. And each of them had some kind of thing that was doing a sensor thing on the pump. And so I said, so where does all this data get done? And they said, well, there's kind of a hardened server-ish computing device. It sounded to me like it was probably, you know, there was like eight of these oil pumps kind of in a in an acre and somewhere in there somebody had plunked down a kind of a hardened form you know a like a, a pc but in a hardened form factor that would be that sort of scenario you just outlined which is you know there's enough stuff locally that you go okay i'm gonna do something i mean i the only question i have about that yeah is what i said before which is that's great how do you then you know, manage the, oh, I need to upgrade the firmware in the thing, or I need to get backups done on it, or I need whatever. And traditionally, that's been a big tear. But I, I think your mantra of you centralize until you can't centralize, and then you distribute. So your default choice is, I'm going to keep it central, because that's where it's the lowest um, administrative effort. I, well, I think we're, I think we're in, a, in a highly... Um, frothy, churny type of thing because the, the, the putting a server per five pumps in the field works great when you are the person making the pumps and you want to own the whole supply chain and you're trying to manage this. Um, and it starts to fall apart when you now have a stack of vendor-specific servers. It's like what data centers used to look like, right? Every, every vendor shows up with their server and their vertical stack and things like that. And then you've got, you know, 10 vendors each managing their own IoT aggregation point and which I, and I don't think this is very far in the future. And then somebody says, okay, wait a second. There's a cell tower here. Can I just rent some space to run a couple of containers in the cell tower? And then the pumps aggregate to that. And then I'm not maintaining the server because that's horrible. 
and I'm not doing it in the cloud because that's too, you know, the latency is, is wrong for that because I actually have a control loop and I need to fix it. And so we're in this place where there's going to be an incredibly gray zone of how, of where you place that compute um, and that, 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 that analytics, that loop. Does that make sense? Well, it's sort of an interesting uh, observation that, um, and I've talked to Equinix because James Staten now works at Equinix and they've got this sort of notion where they put a kind of a small data center into not remote locations, but, you know, sort of uh, frontier look, not, fr not even frontier, but, you know, just dis distributed yep. lots of small things rather than many, than a few big things. But I think their model so far is still an individual enterprise or an individual commercial entity, you know, going to that location and saying, okay, I need a, you know, a couple of servers or a rack or whatever the heck it is. What you've outlined is almost like, um, well, it's a, it's a kind of a container hotel, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, like a cell tower would be like, there's some, you know, so many slots for containers. It, it's a multi-tenant, multi-tenant edge computational node. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say it's, not, it's plausible. Um, I fear that it would be a telco based um, offering, but it's, it's a plausible model. That's for sure. Right. I guess. So it, it, there is a real estate component um, where the telcos seem to have an advantage, but um, yeah, I, I would, I would, Sorry, sorry, telcos. I would, I would not, not bet on you being first into that space um, or, or, or servicing the customers. I'd love to see them rise to their game. I, I, I want to roll back for something because you said you said something, and I'm going to. This will end up being a bit of a, a gratuitous plug, but bear with me for a second because it, it's actually solving a problem. So what we do, what Racken does, is we fully automate gear, very small footprint, um, overhead for the management of it, and. One of the things that we see as the fundamental problem with this is is that you actually care about well wait nobody cares about the infrastructure everybody's goal in life is to not care about infrastructure that's what cloud is about but if if you're distributing gear to hundreds of thousands of cell towers thousands of retail locations um, you know uh, you know millions of intersections distributed in the city or, or wherever you're putting this, this stuff, you actually need to make sure that it's right and managed. And, and that is that is a win-lose factor for this stuff. Because the reason why somebody, I'll get now, now the point, the reason why Schneider Electric is managing that hardened piece of gear is because if it's wrong, they're sending a tech out to fix it. And that's a pain. So you, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go to a, a container hotel, which I love that analogy, and it's all going to be good because it actually matters that it runs correctly. Sort of a, sort of a long rant. Is that, does that make sense? Is that, a, is that part of your formula for this? Uh, well, um, Yeah, I mean, that's sort of why what I was getting at, which is, okay. you know, what, I mean, the, the notion of, oh, I've got the computing right by the thing and it's really convenient is great. And then you've got to wonder about the day two stuff. So, okay, it's there. Right. Now what happens, you know, it needs to be backed up or you need to update the firmware or you need to, um, you know, add another thing or you've got to install a later version of the software you need to patch and, Windows XP because there's a uh, vulnerability in it. Okay, okay. Let's not reach that far. <laughs> Never back. happened. But, but, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, and I need to do that in 1,300 locations, right. not in one place. And, and if I do it wrong, I've bricked 1,300 locations. Yeah. yeah <laughs> then I got a lot of truck rolls. So Dude, that's, that's um, I mean, I think you're right. I think that it has to be managed carefully and that's always been the breakdown with distributed computing it, it yes. makes perfect sense and then the complexities of managing that kind of stuff become extremely challenging i mean it, it, you know you could call it a supply chain issue you know i mean 
there's like just to take a different thing look at mcdonald's they can say we want to go into a country it can take them three to five years to get ready to go into that country because they need to make sure they've got a, re, a, a reliable supply of you know hamburger at the quality they need and potatoes and all that kind of stuff because they've got this very distributed delivery mechanism so they need to do a lot of work and it's kind of the analogous thing around software but but this is where the market could explode if if we get patterns where container hotels make sense right that they're reliable and distributed and available then if i can show up with an iot application in the home or in the field or factory or you know retail location car and and i can count on cloud like you know uh, models for consumption, then all of a sudden the, the, the ROI for that experience from a software development delivery perspective is totally blown out of the water, right? It's, it's as disruptive to um, you know, in-field computing as cloud has been for the last 10 years, right? You can, mm -hmm. you can enter markets that you never could have entered before. Um, with, with much smaller footprints, right? I mean, is that, is that, that's where your scale, your scale com component came, you know, sort of like, oh, everything could be like that. Well, I mean, it, it's in effect, what you're talking about is it becomes a distributed cloud. So, <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Well, I mean, because it's, it, you know, what, what cloud providers do is they go, you don't have to worry about any of that plumbing. Just bring your executable environment and plunk it down in here and we'll run it reliably. We take care of the network connectivity. We take care of making sure that the hardware is up and running, that they're sufficient and all that. <clears throat> well, what you're saying is somebody would, you know, in, let's just say it's out in, you know, some relatively remote location. We'll say it's on the outskirts of Palm Springs would have some little hut, you know, that would have pre-installed com computing infrastructure. Right. And if I said, I want to have something, you know, that's, you know, within the, within two miles of this thing, I can bring my container, install it there. And it's got network connectivity, not just backhaul, but also, you know, availability op ports that can be opened to enable my application, my devices that'll be out a mile and a half away from this thing or whatever to get in and talk to my container and somebody else takes care of the hut and the servers and the network connectivity and all that, which right now somebody like Schneider has to deal with. Yes. Right. Cause if you say, oh, great, I want your stuff in my pumps. It's like, well, we have to go, you know, run lines and we have to do this and we have to do that. I mean, I think that, you know, for the, for the class of IOT applications that could <clears throat> be placed into a location that would be clustered with other, you know, stuff, other applications, then that would make perfect sense. Right. So, and I, I think that ends up not being a whole bunch of small private clouds, but those end up being cloud extensions, right? Private, the, they're, they're not mini clouds that are all little autonomous puddles. Um, they're actually extensions of the cloud experience that people are already having is, is, is because the developers are, are working in public cloud first and then, and then the edge becomes the extension, not the way we've been sort of thinking about it the way I've heard it, which is, oh yeah, we're going to put um, an open stack cloud in every coffee shop on a single node because we want little independent open stacks that, that, to me was not the right pattern. It, it didn't feel like it was you know, sort of like, oh, we want a lot of clouds, but we don't. It's not how people think of, of it. Yeah, I mean, when I said distributed cloud, I, I don't know that I was thinking, you know, a separate, you know, separate infrastructure or something per se. I just like, meant, like, you know, shared infrastructure location there. I, I guess what, what right. you know, one could think of it as being like tentacles off a, a, a central octopus. Or a different way to say it is, you know, Amazon at least, and I'm sure the other providers, but for sure Amazon 
has regions, they have avail availability zones, and they have what they call edge locations, which don't really provide computing, they just provide, you know, ingress and egress of network traffic, but they could easily say, hey, our edge locations now have a thing that you can plunk down containers into. Yes. And though, you know, instead of having, they've got about 95 or 97 edge locations, they could have 950 or 970 of those things. They would take on the responsibility of, we're going to find the place to put it. And, you know, all, you, all the developer, all the provider has to do is show up with a container to drop onto our Wizzo Bango container runner thing. Rather than somebody going, yeah, I'm at the foot locker looking at the OpenStack um, installation and something's not quite right with it, which it wouldn't work, I think. It's this, this I, I think we're, we're hitting these, this, this fundamental commercial uh, component, which is, 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 you know, it's clear in this conversation to me, you know, just casually, we're coming up with a, you know, some amazing edge compute scenarios, places where we're clearly going to see a revolution in human environment compute interaction, things that, that do drive edge, right? There is a need for edge compute. It's, it's separate from the big centralized data center stuff. Um, well, then, but you describe them as being extensions of the big centralized clouds. Yes. So kind of a, like a tentacle or something. That's so when, when I've when I've thought about how this would work, and actually more importantly, when I've talked to people who were trying to use cloud and on premises infrastructure, not even edge, not even what I call edge, the conversation goes like this. I really like the way the cloud works. I'm using immutable images, I'm using CI C D pipelines, I'm using A B testing, I've got all this great successful, high value, high ROI process in cloud. And it makes me very sad to come into my own data center and deal with what we have there. Right. Mm -hmm. That that's the right. You know, and, and, and the funny thing is, is that there are people in those data centers fighting tooth and nail against the cloud migration, not realizing that it's not about where the, the, the data center is. It's about all these amazing processes that are improving efficiency and, and doing that, right? And to me, when I look at the edge, the edge is going to look like the cloud process because it has to. It can't scale if you're dealing with, you know, 2010 IT um, process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, I, 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 well, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think if the solution, and, I, and that's what I was reacting to in my blog post is if the solution to... IOT is, well, we're just going to, you know, recreate the, the, you know, the, the data center mess that we've got, but just in little tiny ones out in a lot of locations. It's like, that's not going to work. That's, that's a fail pattern. Yes. You know, Bernard, that, that's my, that's my whole strategy for my next career. Don't, don't uh, poo poo this thing. Don't harsh, for don't, me. Harsh, don't harsh your Zen. I am, uh, you know, it was all going to be Zen, of course, because there is no other hypervisor. You know. Well, um, yeah, well, uh, that's, that's what I was reacting to. I mean, there's, there's a whole tranche in the industry, both vendors and end users that are kind of going, oh, we're gonna have all this edge stuff. And it follows, it falls into the anecdote, anecdote, vapid truism. Hey, my talking points. And that's why you need to buy yeah. my Wizzo Bango, you know, server or whatever. <clears throat> and, you know, and build your little edge locations. And I just think that that way lies madness. All right. This has been an amazing conversation because I feel like we, we dug super deep. We got, we came back to your point. Um, anybody listening to this who doesn't think that the fabric of the, the commercial fabric of, of infrastructure is getting even further torn apart by what cloud has been doing and the way people think about cloud, um, that, that you're just going to go back and sell the hyper-converged servers that you designed 10 years ago and are looking for a market. Uh, I think Bernard's giving you a wake up call. I think he and I are highly aligned on that. Steven, what's, you've been, you've been quiet. What's your, what's your thought? Well, you know, 
my thought, and I don't want to start a whole new thread, but to me, I always think about the fact that it, all we do is swing back and forth from centralized everything to, you know, we went from mainframes to client server to cloud, and now Edge is just taking part of the cloud and swinging it back, but not calling it a client. So um, it's all interesting that IoT massively scales us. I mean, I guess it's an incredibly exciting time in the industry. At the same time, we're the folks trying to build this and make it happen. And I think there's a lot of confusion now and no one's quite sure. And I think that's what's great about conversations like this is that, uh, you know, thought leaders like the two of you are going back and forth what it could be. And, um, and, and that's why uh, I enjoy doing these podcasts and getting people like you guys on it. Awesome. But uh, hey, hey, Bernard, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, when we started these podcasts, we were like, yeah, 10, 15 minutes. And now that we're doing 30, 40 <laughs> minute podcasts, it's amazing. But, you know, the discussions are, are so good in these things. And if you're listening to this, uh, you know, reach out to Rob, reach out to Bernard. Let's let's keep these discussions going. If you if you have an opinion, you want to debate with these guys, let me know. I am happy to get you on with the podcast and, you know, the ranting and raving that Rob likes to do. We were just too polite again today, Rob. <laughs> I'm not sure. Bernard, I, I mean, you know, I'm not sure why we're so nice to you. We need some angry people. But we need Bernard's to get some angry people. Maybe we'll get John Willis on here and tell him that DevOps isn't real. And then that'll get it. He'll snap. But uh, thanks to both of you uh, for joining how, today. How can, how can people get in touch with before yeah, you out right. us? How yeah, do... Bernard, where should they go to reach out to you? They should go to bernardgolden.com and they can see my stuff and there's a contact form and they can get a hold of me if they'd like to. Great. Well, I encourage you to talk to Bernard. And, and Bernard, one other thing, you're really leading on blockchain right now. I know that you're doing a lot there. So um, maybe I'll let you do a quick plug. I won't let you just go ahead. Do a quick plug on your blockchain stuff because I think it's really interesting. Well, I put together a course on blockchain because there's so much potential around breaking down silos between organizations in value chains financial services for sure, but also lots of places where you get complex value chains and cross organizational uh, interactions. And, uh, you know, so you can think of uh, manufacturing, a lot of like PC manufacturing or device manufacturing, those things go through many different hands. And there's lots of handoffs and lots of places where mistakes get made or stuff gets dropped or whatever. Blockchain has you know, which is a decentralized way of approaching that. A lot of potential. Well, great. Well, thanks again, Bernard and uh, Rob, and, and look forward to uh, future conversations. And you never quite know where we're going to go. And if you're listening and you have an idea, reach out to Rob or myself and uh, let us know who you'd like to have on as a guest and we can make it happen. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you all.